So um, I, I just want to quickly welcome everybody back. Uh, thank you for, for um, joining this conversation and especially I want to welcome partners that, uh, that this might be your first session of the day that you're signing into. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Naomi. I think uh, at the end we should have some time for question and answer. So feel free to use the chat function at the bottom and, uh, and put questions in there. It, that's probably the cleanest way to do it. Um, or we can, I, I mean, I guess it's work to just have people chime in as well. So whatever you're most comfortable with, we can say, we'll, we'll go about it that way. Um, but Naomi, uh, welcome. And, and thanks for doing this. Thanks for joining us today. Well, happy to be here with you. And where are you? I should have asked that. Where are you right now? Uh, well, I'm on my porch <laughs> of my house, my front porch of my house. This is where I take all board, power board meetings. And I live in Carlisle, Massachusetts, which is a sort of leafy exurb about 20 miles west of Boston. Okay, excellent. And what's the weather like there today? It looks warm. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful, kind of warm, late autumn day colors. Trees are starting to turn. My roses are hanging in there for a few more weeks. So it's a uh, it's pretty nice right now. No, oh, that's good. Great. Well, again, thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, I know that your schedule is is completely bonkers, and I, I do appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, one other thing, just to say right off the top, I think some people might be intimidated, you know, to be in my position right now to uh, to be interviewing you, right? Like you're a well accomplished Harvard professor. You have a PhD, and. Uh, but, but you know what, I'm, I'm not that intimidated because uh, you do have those three letters, PhD behind your name, but I also have some letters behind my name too. Um, and you have three and I actually have four. Mine are G, T, and F. And uh, if you don't know what that is, it stands for gr grade 12, no French. So I, I feel like I'm in an elite category with you here Definitely. Uh, Definitely. academically. Um, so Naomi, you're no stranger to PAL. You've, you've been involved with PAL US almost from the start, like since 2009, you've been a board member. One of the highlights for me so far in my PAL involvement was a trip in 2018 that Marie, uh, Mike and I took down to Yosemite for, for the annual leadership camp down there. And of course we had an opportunity to camp with you and, and to hear you speak. And that was, that was, uh, um, totally, totally inspiring for us. So we're, we're really excited um, to kind of share some of that energy with the Canadian folks. And maybe you could talk to us a bit about your your connection to PAL and and how you got connected and why why you chose Protect Our Winters. Because from from my perspective, as someone that is kind of charged with trying to find board members in Canada, um, you know good people like yourself are also really hard to get because you you could be with any board of directors any climate group in the country um mm -hmm. so what is it about pow that uh that made you want to invest time and energy well i'd say there's a few things first of all thanks it's just great to be with you and um there's such great energy around pow us and i'm sure it's the same in pow canada so it's really a pleasure to be with you guys um i think there's a few things you you actually put the first one front and center, which is that, you know, we met camping in Yosemite. I'm on the board of a number of NGOs. I go to conferences all the time. You know, I've met the Pope. I get to go to a lot of pretty cool places. I'd have a pretty good life. But this is the only group I know that has a conference camping out. <laughs> and, and, you know, that summit was a great summit because we do real work. We work hard, but we also play hard and we go to beautiful places because that's what this is all about. This is about protecting the beautiful places that we cherish and that really sums up why I got involved with PAL in the first place and why I continue to be committed to this organization. Because as we all know, climate change is a bad news story. And there's a lot of gloom and doom around the destruction, the devastation, the loss. And it's a hard thing to talk about. And it can be a hard thing to work on because it can be demoralizing. And because a lot of people times people don't want to hear it. Our friends and families, you know, they say enough with the gloom and doom. And they, you know, no one likes bad news. So, but when I, I first met Audie Schendler and then Jeremy Jones and some of the other POW folks, I thought the brilliant thing that they had come up with, with the idea, was the idea of turning that on its head. And rather than making a gloom and doom story, making a story about fighting to protect the things we love, fighting to protect the places we cherish, places of stunning natural beauty, um, and fighting to protect our fun, 
because snowing, ski board, you know, sorry, snowing, snow, ski board, skiing, snowboarding, rock climbing, trail running, fishing, being outdoors, these are the things that make us happy. These are the things that make life good. So we're protecting, we're fighting to protect something really good. And the more we can put that positive message front and center, the more I think we can reach a lot of people who maybe we otherwise wouldn't have been able to reach. And then the third thing is the fighting piece. Um, you know, you said I could probably be on any board I wanted, but actually, you know, one of the things I've learned about a lot of environmental groups, a lot of people in general, a lot of people are afraid of conflict. They're afraid of the fight. They're afraid of things that are hard. And this is hard. This is tough. And what I love about athletes, what I love about rock climbers and power in general, you know, we don't shy away because something's hard. In fact, it's kind of the opposite, right? When the going gets tough, you know, we dig in, right? And I'd always been interested in winter sports and athletics. I'd done a lot of hiking and backpacking. Um, I'd done a little bit of rock climbing. Uh, I was a skier, you know, but POW made me up my game, both in terms of my physical activities and my politics, because this is about the fight. It's about digging in, or as Auden Schendler likes to say, you know, this is full conditions. And any of us who've skied in a blizzard know that it's tough, but it's also like crazy exciting, right? And so there is a way in which power can be crazy exciting because we really dig in and we're not afraid of the fight. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're totally right. And, and we're inspired by that up here. Like we're inspired by the energy that you guys are putting into it in the States and, uh, and a, a big chunk of that motivates us. So just really quickly to, to highlight this, um, you alluded to it, you talked uh, in the past tense as being a skier. Do, do you still? Oh, yeah, no, no, I, yeah, no, I still ski. No, okay. I, ski, I ski more now than I used to. I mean, I always ski kind of a bit, but I've really upped my game since getting to know, you know, the POW folks. And uh, sometimes now when I'm out skiing something that looks a little hard, I think, you know, like I had the honor of skiing with Caroline Gleick last winter, um, and I've now got to rock climb with Conrad Anker. And I was trying to explain to some of my friends what it was to rock climb with Conrad Anker. And I said, well, imagine taking a golf lesson from Tiger Woods. <laughs> so, um, so to be able to be with these amazing people and think, yeah, well, I can up my game. You know, I can do a little more here. Right? For sure. No, good. Um, I, I mentioned that we take a lot of energy um, here in Canada from the work that you guys are doing down there in the States. and and. Um, before we get too far into this, I think it's also important to acknowledge the fact that Canada and the U.S. are very differently um, politically, economically, and, and socially. And I think, like, from the North, uh, over the last four years, we've really witnessed what appears to be like an unprecedented deepening of divides that, that further kind of highlight the inequities in the U.S. And you know, don't get me wrong at all. We have our, our own fair share of, um, of laundry that needs to be, um, that needs to be addressed here. But um, it's really astounding for me to look and see the pace that these, uh, that these, these divides have deepened. And in Canada, from a climate perspective, I'm really thankful to tell you that, that there isn't much of a debate about climate change anymore. You know, the root causes, the, all the political parties here, and, and we have five of them, which is too many. But um, they all acknowledge that climate change is real, it's caused by humans, and, and that it needs to be addressed. What's different is that they all have, you know, different paths and, and different approaches to how they're going to solve that. But, but the bottom line is, as an organization, compared to in the U.S., we, we don't really have to spend a lot of bandwidth on trying to um, convince people that climate change is an issue, and, and instead we can just focus straight in on, on policy development and advocacy. But um, again, just before we jump too far in, I, I was wondering if you have any commentary kind of on, on what's happening in the U.S. right now. Um, and I, I, I don't mean to go like down, I, I know this could yeah. go down a long dark path, but. Yeah, well, you know, as, as I said before, we're in full conditions. I mean, things here are, are bad. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. And so, you know, my metaphor is dig in, right? When the going gets tough, that's when we really find out what we're made of. And I think this has been kind of a heroic year for POW here and for a lot of NGOs and other organizations because um, we feel like we're already working hard and now we have to work harder. And the only thing I can really say with respect to Canada is, um, yes, of course, you have a lot of things are better in Canada. And uh, many of us here, of course, sometimes wish we lived on the other side of the border. But, you know, things can change very quickly. And as you said, things have 
things have been bad in the United States for a while, but they've become dramatically worse in the last four years. Um, but they could change in Canada too. And you know, you had the Harper government, which wasn't exactly a model of climate progressivism. And you know, I, I worked on a major report for the Council of Canadian Academies during the Harper years. And we had a lot of staff we were working with who were very, very intimidated by the Harper administration. And they were afraid to write a strong report for fear that the Harper administration would just ignore it. And one of the things I said to the staff was, but we're not just doing this for this moment. The Harper administration will not last forever. And when it's gone, we need to have a strong report that the next prime minister or the next premier can use and look to and say, this is what the Council of Canadian Academies said on this issue. So I think part of the trick of social change, social movements, political activism, is that you're balancing the immediacy, um, you know, the fierce urgency of now, with also a bigger vision about what happens next and how we carry this baton forward. And so right now in the United States, we are very much in a fierce immediate moment. We're working really hard at PAL to get out the vote uh, because we know that a lot of environmentalists shockingly don't vote. A lot of young people shockingly don't vote. So we're working really hard on the get out the vote issue. Uh, but we also know that no matter what happens in November, there's going to be a ton of work to do, um, you know, no matter who wins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very um, different world right now, as you said, even from four years ago, but, but even just six or seven months ago, you know, pre, um, pre pandemic. And I think, um, you know, it, it really does seem like a lifetime ago, but it was just seven months ago. And, and climate seemed to be on the lips of every thinking person on, uh, on the planet. You know, here in Canada, we had half a million people marching in the streets of Montreal with Greta when she came. Um, yeah. And we had a federal election one month after that, that for the first time in history, climate was the top concern. You know, it, 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 was, it was front and center. But, you know, the recent events with the pa pandemic seemed to have really kind of swept it all away um, from our attention. Uh, is that something that, that worries you? That you're, you know, keeps you up at night and, and that you're kind of grappling with? Well, a lot of things keep me up at night, but I wouldn't say it's that especially. I mean, there are always things that compete for our attention and often rightly so. I mean, climate change is a profound issue, but of course it's not the only issue that uh, we have to address. But I think, you know, the potentially optimistic way of viewing this is that um, COVID-19 has reminded us of a number of things which are also relevant to climate change. And the most obvious is that we're all in this together. The idea that we could somehow avoid contagion in the United States by just, say, shutting off travel from China. Well, it turned out the early cases didn't come from China. They came from Europe. So, um, and we're seeing now there were people in North and South Dakota who thought, well, we don't need to shut down because, you know, we're not crowded like New York. Well, guess what? COVID-19 is now raging through North and South Dakota. So this is a reminder that, you know, what happens in one place affects people in another place. And of course, climate change isn't the ultimate example of that too. Uh, you know, you may feel that what you do doesn't affect people in another state or another country or another province, but of course it does. And this is why these are challenging problems because we do have to work together. We have to find a way to work together and address what is a very big problem both by doing what we can do individually and also through large scale structural change. So in that sense, COVID-19 could be viewed as a kind of dress rehearsal for climate change. And I think we can make the case that both of these uh, problems are urgent, they need our attention and the kinds of solutions we need though, um, it's not either or, it's both and because building the institutions that will give us resiliency for climate change will also give us resiliency in the face of pandemics. Absolutely, I, I I completely agree with you. Um, you know, but like, just in the last while here, I was reading, and and there's been this kind of changes by the week, but some of the data that's coming out, it it really looks like the it, or yeah, it, it appears right now that the decline in emissions that we've seen throughout this pandemic, you know, isn't really that much more than the fall that we need to see every year. Um, for the next several years to meet some of these targets under the Paris Climate Agreement. And, um, you, you know, obviously we can talk and speculate about if, if these are, uh, how long this reduction will actually be noticed. 
But you, you know, the sense that we've witnessed that from this pandemic, the, this decline in, in emissions and something that's you know, relatively close to, to what we need on an annual basis, is that something that, that gives you hope or, or does that actually, you know, in the context of what we've been through, does that make it actually feel more daunting? Yeah, I think it makes it feel more daunting because, but, but again, there's a positive way to spin that. So it's very daunting because, you know, we've had this terrific problem here in the United States, more than 200,000 people have died, more than a million cases. Our economy is a mess. Uh, we have the highest levels of unemployment since the Great Depression. So, and, the, and we've only cut emissions 5%, right? So that's not a good news story. Uh, I know there were a lot of people who wanted to be excited and wanted to find a good news story in the emissions reductions. But what it's telling us that even with huge sacrifice and even with huge damage to the economy, we've only cut the emissions 5%. And we can't afford to sustain this kind of damage, both to the economy and to the public at large, every year for the next 50 years. That's just not, that's not something we can even imagine. So it tells us that the change has to be structural. It's not enough. I mean, this is the proof positive. I mean, I get asked all the time about, you know, the personal responsibility versus the structural change. And of course, it's not either or. We need to do both. And there are lots of good reasons for taking on personal responsibility even if it's just a small piece of the puzzle. But it tells us that the big picture is about structural change because we don't want to say to people, you have to give up your life to fix climate change. No, what we want to say is you can travel, you can visit your family, you can see your friends, but you have to do it in a different way. And it's got to be in a green economy dependent primarily on renewable energy. And that's not something I can do by myself. I often like to say to people, I can change my light bulbs, but I can't change my electricity grid. For that, I have to become organized with other activists to pressure the state government, to pressure the public utilities, to pressure the federal government to implement the policies that will enable the transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. And one of the most clearest examples of that has to do with fossil fuel subsidies. So um, globally, fossil fuel subsidies continued to a tune of about $600 billion every year. This is ridiculous. It's preposterous. And every single country in the world uh, that is a fossil fuel producing country, whether it's the United States, Canada, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, all have subsidies, um, both producer and consumer subsidies. This is crazy. So we need to organize to change that. And we need to insist that our governments phase out fossil fuel subsidies so that renewables can compete on a level playing field. Because we know now that if we just do that, renewables will win. It's not the case that we have to somehow subsidize renewables. It's we have to stop uh, loading the dice in favor of fossil fuels. And that is something we can do, but we're not going to do it alone. We're only going to do it if we organize and become a political force. Yeah, so the, that actually ties perfectly, Naomi, into what we were um, talking about earlier today, but is the idea of collective action and, and that that really is at the root of what POW is about. And, and we looked a little bit at at, you know the power of sending an email to to an MP during a campaign and 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 what that can possibly mean in a successful campaign compared to what you'd have to do in your individual life to to have the same impact. Um, and and you know a lot of this is based on um, on information. Like we need anybody within this phone call they want to know a certain amount of, of baseline information before they feel comfortable in, in using their voice that way. Because it, you know, especially for an athlete, there's a lot of exposure potentially as right. someone that, that relies on having to travel and, and, and so on. Um, so, so again, one of the things that we're trying to do today in today's session is, is to really equip ambassadors and our partners for that matter with the information that they that they need to really feel confident to jump into the PAL movement and, and, and to use their voice in a meaningful way. But, but I think the operative word in that statement is, is information. Um, you know, if, if you're a pro skier or a snowboarder and you're, you're standing on top of, uh, of a mountain that you're about to go down, obviously the more information you have, the, the better, like the aspect, the pitch and the snowpack. Um, but there's some groups that are out there that are trying to work really hard to um, to give the impression that the information of the science on climate change is inconclusive that it's that it's just not um uh it, it, you know it, it's 
it's inaccurate. Um, can you talk to that, to the idea that there are actually people and groups and, and wealth finance groups that are out there in the U.S. and in Canada that are um, that are intentionally casting doubt on, on this? Yes, sure. Well, as you know, this is something that I worked on for a long time. So my 2010 book with Eric Conway, Merchants of Doubt, was all about this. And we wrote the book because we had discovered this fact that the people who were claiming that we didn't really know if climate change was real or it wasn't that serious or there was no scientific consensus, um, that they were part of an organized network, that they were linked to right-wing think tanks, uh, politically oriented think tanks, not scientific organizations, and that they were mostly funded by the fossil fuel industry. And so when we discovered that in our research, we felt that that was an important story to tell because, um, well, it's important for a number of reasons. I mean, the obvious one is that if people are confused about the science, they're less likely to act. And we have lots of evidence to show that this is the case. And it makes sense, right? If I, if I don't really know if climate change is real, then why would I spend a lot of time and effort trying to fight it? Or why would I change the way I live? You know, why would I give up something that I like, perhaps, uh, for a problem that might not be real? And in fact, that was one of the big campaigns that the coal industry in the United States ran back in the 1990s. Why would you spend money fixing a problem that might not be real anyway, right? So they're very clever, they're very organized and very well funded. The good news, what we found through our work was that when we could explain that to people and say, this is not a scientific debate, this is a disinformation campaign. And it's paid for by the fossil fuel industry. And it's run by the same people who told you that smoking was fine. Because that was the other big discovery we made in our work, that the people who were denying climate change Many of them were the same people who had worked with the tobacco industry to deny the harms of smoking. Um, and it turned out they had a whole history of denying scientific evidence, a whole set of different issues, climate change, acid rain, the ozone hole. So why would you believe people like that? Why would you believe someone who told you that luckies make you healthy? This is a con job. And we found that that was a very powerful message because here's the thing, no one wants to be conned. No one wants to be a sucker. No one wants to be at the losing end of a con. And so we found that exposing it for what it was um, really shifts it for a lot of people. And so this is why, why I encourage athletes to try to, I mean, of course you should read my book, but if you don't want to read the book, you can watch the movie. <laughs> so, um, you know, to learn at least a little bit about this, because you will find if you go out into public, you've probably found this already, there will be someone in the audience who will say, well, how do we know this isn't just natural variability? How do we know that it isn't just, you know, volcanoes? Um, and there are people in Canada actively promoting these, these disinformation claims. And you will find people in your audience who have read them and who have been maybe at least a little bit persuaded by them. They might not be climate change deniers, but they have read these claims and are perhaps confused by them. And if you try to say, oh, that's wrong and let me explain the science, it doesn't actually solve the problem because the person can still be left with doubt. Well, you say the science is clear, but my neighbor Joe says that it's not. And so I don't know what to think. But if you say, well, that's actually disinformation paid for by the fossil fuel industry, that puts it in a whole different light. And we found it's very powerful to tell this story and really help shift the, shift the narrative into the space of, wow, that pisses me off. I don't want someone telling me a pile of lies and I'm not going to listen any longer to something that I know are lies. Yeah. So I, I mean, I can talk for myself um, from experience that at several POW events that we, that we had, especially early on when we were uh, doing some cross country trips um, and, and conversations that there were people in the audience that I would be very surprised if they weren't actually planted there. You, you know, if, if they weren't there, especially when we were in, in, um, in Western Canada, like in Alberta, um, it really felt like that was the case and they gave some of our athletes a, a hard time. So it is, it's incredible to, to um, hear that that's still the case. And, and for POW athletes and partners, if you haven't read Naomi's book, um, or if, if you want to uh, watch the movie, I, I totally recommend that you do that. It's, um, it's very powerful. Yeah. And I mean, there definitely are fossil fuel industry plants, but I find personally, Rather than assume that the folks are plants, which they may be, but but you, and sometimes you can tell because their suits are just way too good, but, you know, but, and I've been in cases where there were people who clearly, you know, were K Street lobbyists because they were just wearing these very expensive suits, but 
I usually try to not make that assumption just to say, well, even if they are a plant, and even if they're not arguing in good faith, there may be other people in the audience who have thought the same question, have the same question, or who have heard the same argument. And so it's really important for me to answer it in a kind of generous and compassionate way, um, not, to, not to pull my punches. I mean, I'm going to say that's disinformation, but to, but to respond in a respectful way to answer the question because other people in the audience may have the same question. And so I'm not really just answering it for the aggressive or belligerent person who posed the question, but also for other people in the audience. If they do also raise a scientific question, um, I will try to answer it. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't get this as much as I used to, but used to get the volcano one all the time. How do we know it's not volcanoes? And that was a simple one. And I would just say, well, we know because actually the dust from volcanoes makes the world cooler, not hotter. Simple answer. But let me go on and explain to you a more important thing is that that claim is disinformation. So you can do both, and You can answer the scientific question, um, and then you can also go on there to expose this for what it is. And if people are not clear about the science, you know, this has been a hard thing for us because frankly, so much of the scientific information is available in formats that are really, really difficult to get through. I mean, the IPCC is kind of hopeless for an ordinary person. It's practically hopeless even like for me, um, you know, for those of us with PhDs. Uh, but um, there are some good sources at POW USA. We've tried to have, um, I think we still have on our website, I haven't looked lately, but I know some years ago we had a thing we had developed with sort of simple answers to common questions. Um, there's some really great stuff on the NASA website that my co-author Eric Conway has helped to put together. If you go to uh, nasa.gov, I guess, I don't know, US, I don't know if you have, anyway, but I mean, if you type, they have a great sign uh, on thing on like the evidence of climate change. If you just Google NASA evidence climate change, you should be able to find that, or I can send the links to you later if people are interested. And then also the website, people, some people may know skepticalscience.com. They have a great web page where they have simple answers to the 10 most common uh, disinformation tropes. So if nothing else, you can read that and prepare yourself and just be ready because the same questions come up over and over and over again. I mean, partly they do because they are um, tropes and, and they're on a lot of right wing media. So if you just you know, prepare yourself with answers to the 10 most common forms of disinformation, you'll be in a pretty good place and then you can also say, and if you don't believe me, read Naomi Oreskes' book, Merchants of Doubt. <laughs> That's great. Um, we, we'll try to share some of that information out with the ambassadors um, afterwards. Uh, so, so if we have these people that are out there kind of suppressing this information, these, these merchants of doubt, um, it, it's almost like, you know, there's this party happening that um, our, our our invitation has been held up by the postal service intentionally, and, and we're just getting the invitation now, and it's a little bit late. Um, so, like, and, and, and not necessarily going down the part of, of um, you know, the information that we need to, to give us hope, but like, can you help us just frame kind of where we are with this? Like, what, um, how bad is it? What, what are we up against? What, how quickly do we need to move on this? You mean how bad is it politically or how bad is it in terms of like the physical world? Physical world. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I didn't really have to ask you it's bad either way, but um, yeah, I mean, it's really bad. So if you've read the IPCC 1.5 degree report or read any of the uh, media about the 1.5 degree report, um, basically what it said was that we only have till 2030 to make major reductions um, emissions reductions. Probably we need to cut emissions by about 50% by 2030. So that's now only 10 years away. And the way I think about this is that the price of denial has been that we have lost so much time. Because scientists were warning about the threat of climate change way back in the 1960s and 70s. And scientists declared that climate change was happening in 1988, which is when the IPCC was created. So that's like some of the athletes in this group probably weren't even born yet, right? Um, if we had started, and, and then the, the world signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992, to which both the US and Canada are signatories. In fact, Canadians played a really big role in the Earth Summit in Rio where the Framework Convention was signed. So that was 1992, so nearly 30 years ago. 30 years is a long time, you know, it's as long as some of the people on this call have probably been alive half my lifetime, 
And it's a long time in the history of technology. You can do a lot in 30 years. You can build factories, you can build power plants. Um, you know, you can totally retrofit an entire city's worth of housing. So if we had started in 1992, we could have this problem largely fixed by now, but we don't because of the delay. And so I think the people who are responsible for delay, um, you know, we should be really angry at them. And then we should channel that anger into the demand for action because it didn't have to be this way. The technology to fix this problem has already been around for a long time. Admittedly, it was some fairly expensive back in 1992. It's now cheap. Renewable energy is now cheaper than fossil fuels in most places in the world. Um, so there's really no excuse for what has happened. Uh, and so I think we have a right to be angry. But again, as I said, and, and, and this is the other thing I like to say, I mean, a lot of people are afraid of anger. Anger is kind of a scary and uncomfortable emotion. And it's often not good, but sometimes it's justified. Sometimes we have a right to be angry. So, no, so long as we channel it into productive action, then I think anger is a good thing. So yes, things are bad. We don't have much time left and we should be angry about that. Mm. Yeah, it, it, I, I mean, that reminds me of Patagonia's uh, campaign with, with the asshole tag. And, 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 you know, kind of that activates some anger. Like that, it, right. there's right. anger based in that. Right. And when people tell you to be nice, well, I mean, if they were nice, that would be fine. And you should be nice to animals and children. But should you be nice to people who have been lying to you about an existential threat and who are responsible now for trillions of dollars of damages and for hurricanes being worse and wildfires that are destroying communities? I don't think we have to be nice to those people. I think we should basically be really mean to them. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, completely. And it was good to hear you talk about the, um, you know, the solutions and the technologies, that, like the, the innovation that's needed for this, that, that it's all there. And, and, and to me, that's something that gives me hope is knowing that, like I, I actually listened to Elon Musk's um, Battery Day uh, speech that mm. he did this week. And I mean, just that alone is, and if athletes haven't seen that yet, you should really Google Elon Musk Battery Day on, and, and it's on YouTube and you can watch it. It's 42 minutes or something. But um, actually, yeah. let me just jump in on that because I think there's also yeah. really important. So, so, little known fact about me I'm a geologist by training, and my first job was in the mining industry. And, um, you know, back in the 80s, it was very common for people in the mining industry to have these bumper stickers that said, let the bastards freeze in the dark. Right. Do you remember, I don't know if you're old enough to remember that or if you still have that. You may still have that in Alberta. But um, and this is just so false. Right. Because this isn't about freezing in the dark. There's lots of great technology. And anyone who has had the privilege of driving a Tesla. Um, well, I can't say I've actually driven one, but I've driven in Eric Conway's Tesla. Um, these are amazing cars. These cars are so fantastic and they are so much better than your standard internal combustion engine. Um, so a lot of renewable technologies are terrific technologies. They work well, they work better than the ones that um, they would replace. So it's not about freezing, it's not about being in the dark, it's not about suffering. It's about better technologies that will make our lives better and protect the environment that we depend on. Yeah, amen, uh, completely. And, and I think that that's like, if people get down in the doom and gloom of it, you know, that's something to hang your hat on for sure. But, um, I, I think what, you know, when you get past that and we talk about how quickly those things need to happen, that's that the pace that it needs to happen far exceeds anything that we've seen before. And so that's really what I wanted to ask you next was, are there um, like historical examples of this scale of transformation, um, things that will give us hope or that we can kind of use as a, as a guiding star? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are some examples, there aren't a lot because it is true that technological change often you know, happens gradually. But uh, certainly if we think about things like electrification, when we first electrified North America in the first place, um, an awful lot of that was done in about 10 or 20 years. Uh, the adoption of telephone, uh, television, many of the telecommunication technologies in the 20th century, once they um, were sold to consumers as consumer products, spread quite rapidly within 10 to 20 years. And that's why, you know, that's why I do get angry about the 30 years that we've lost here, because that's a long time in the history of technology. Um, the other analogy that we have is war mobilization. And if you look at what the United States during World War II, the scale of that 
was commensurate with what we now need to do on climate change. So that tells us that we can do it, but that the only really great example we have of doing it rapidly um, on sort of on command is World War II. And so that tells us something about the sense of urgency that we need to have. And, and I think that's partly the problem we're facing now is that even though those of us who are say on this call today probably do have a sense of urgency about this issue, most of our friends and neighbors and colleagues and fellow citizens don't. So how do we create that sense of urgency? And that's hard because climate change isn't one thing. You know, I've said this for a long time. If it were just one thing, it would be easier to explain, but it's a million things. It's every species that's threatened. It's every winter that's not as cold as it should be in the snow melts or a lake that doesn't freeze so you can't ice fish or ski on or skate on it. Um, you know, it's every hurricane that's a little bit worse, every rainstorm that's a little heavier and floods a community, every fire that's worse because of climate change. So it's the death of a thousand cuts. And how do you convey that? And how do you convey the urgency of it? And this is where then we get, we get stuck in that gloom and doom thing. And this I think is part of the challenge of being an ambassador is to find a way to convey the urgency without just depressing your audience. So for example, one thing that was in the news just this week has to do with what's happening in Greenland and the massive amount of ice lofts that is taking. I can remember 20 years ago reading about Greenland in which scientists were worried about, um, I'm gonna just move my computer here slightly so I can talk in my hands. So it's always been the case that in the summer in Greenland, the ice melts around the edges, a bit on the East Coast and a bit on the West Coast. And more than 20 years ago, scientists started noticing that the ice melt was moving inward so that the area away from the coast that was melting was getting bigger. And so the risk was that eventually, if we didn't stop this, um, it would come together and the melt in the summer would reach the middle and then the whole thing would be destabilized. 20 years ago, people thought that was a threat, but they didn't know how serious a threat, they didn't know how worried they should be. Just this week in the news, we now have evidence that this, the summer ice melt is so great that that threat is almost certainly going to happen. And when that happens, we're not talking about centimeters of sea level rise, we're talking about meters of sea level rise. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of people around the globe and trillions of dollars of infrastructure, um, housing, homes, ports, airports. I mean, just think about how many airports are at sea level. I mean, here in the United States, you know, probably 10 of our biggest sea airports are at sea level. Kennedy Airport in New York, Miami Beach, uh, Miami Airport in Florida, San Francisco Airport uh, in California, San Diego Airport. I mean, practically all the airports that I used to fly in and out of before COVID hit, they're all at sea level. So this is trillions and trillions of dollars. And what does that mean? It means we have to spend huge amounts of money repairing the damage. It means communities will be lost. It means people will have to move. So, you know, something like that, picking, choosing one thing that's very tangible that then you can translate into trillions of dollars of losses where we all become poorer because now we don't have the money to spend on things we like, you know, like schools and hospitals or museums or, or, or whatever, or just giving money back to taxpayers. Um, so that kind of tangible thing, if you can identify something really serious and really important. And, it, and I find that that works best if you talk about something that connects to the community you're in. So I spent some time in, um, South Dakota a couple of years ago where the bark beetle damage is very, very severe and very obvious. And so I was fortunate to have a few days in the Black Hills before I gave my lecture and I just took a bunch of photos. And then when I talked, I said, look, you know, I could talk about sea level, but honestly, if you're in South Dakota, sea level rise is probably not your biggest worry, but bark beetle damage is. And you now have um, tens of thousands of square miles of forests that are being destroyed. And of course that applies to so much of Western Canada, BC as well, right? So depending upon where you are, you can pick a particular thing that relates to that community. And obviously if it's a winter sports community, then that's, well, that's where we get into the winter part of Protect Our Winters, right? If you're talking to people in the ski industry, the snowboard industry, uh, ice climbing, whatever it is, talking to them. And of course, Power US, you know, we've been tracking this issue of how much winter sports are worth to the US economy. I assume you guys have similar numbers for Canada. Um, for the right audiences, those kinds of numbers are really, really powerful. And pointing out there are more jobs in renewable energy than there are in fossil fuels now. So why are we, why are we so worried about fossil fuel jobs? That's not where the action 
and the economy is. And here in the United States, the renewable energy sector is the single fastest growing sector of the economy. So if people are worried about jobs and the economy, the best thing we could possibly do is to foster the growing renewable energy industry. Yeah, we, it, we're in a very similar boat here, like re renewables are. Um, and yeah, they, well, that, it, that's a breath of fresh air, um, Naomi, how, how you frame that. Thank you. You're welcome. And, we, I see there are questions in the chat. Should we take some yeah, audience questions now? We, Let's do that. Just, just before we jump in, I have one other question for you. Just sure. one last question is, is um, so like, you, you know, we, as you've said, we've seen this before, like in uh, around wars where people have done, uh, they've, they've been able to do this or, or maybe uh, Kennedy's, you know, commitment for to put a man on the moon might be, but uh, what, what movements have actually um, mm -hmm been successful at accelerating change in, in history? And, and as we think of ourselves as, as a movement, are there um, ones that we can look to that, that hey, they, they did it right? And I know you've done a lot of work on, on this. With yeah. the well, I'm not a historian of social movement, but obviously we do have good examples. And I think the best example in recent memory is the gay rights, gay marriage example, because you know in the United States, uh, even as recently as 30 years ago or 40 years ago, you know, gay rights was really um, a pretty controversial thing. My husband, who moved to San Francisco in the early 1980s, likes to talk about how when he first moved to San Francisco, there would be these gay rights parades, and they would be filled with people who seemed pretty eccentric, <laughs> you know, to put it politely, right? Uh, and in a pretty short period of time, gay rights went from, from being this very out there, pretty in your face, pretty eccentric thing, to being very mainstream, to being validated by the U.S. Supreme Court of the United States and to the right of gay people to marry became kind of like ordinary, like, yes, we want to get married and have children just like everybody else. So that transformation happened pretty quickly um, and pretty dramatically, right? And one of the things we do know about that is that it was not just chance, that it was a very organized strategy, that the marriage equality movement was very smart about um, how they use the legal system to uh, win cases on the state level, to choose cases that they thought would have a good chance of winning, and then ultimately to bring it all the way to the US Supreme Court and have a huge success there. So I think anyone who's interested in that part of this problem should definitely do some reading around the history of marriage equality and what some of the strategies were that they successfully used to affect real social change in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, okay. That's exactly what we were looking for. Uh, and, and again, we can do a bit of a, a dive on that and share that out to people. Um, as you noted, there are questions here in the chat. How, how do we want to handle those? Do you want me to um, read them? Or Izzy, do you want to kind of curate them? There's some up at the top there. Um, I'm not great at navigating this. Probably best if one, of the, if one of the staff curates the questions. That's probably the best. From, from Janine, um, at the beginning we have, do you think the general public makes a connection between COVID and climate change, um, similar to kind of what you mentioned, the whole dress rehearsal thing. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know that we have good data on that yet. Um, so I, I don't know. I certainly know lots of us in the United States have been talking about it. We've been talking about the parallels and talking about how the same people who reject the evidence of climate change were also the people who told us we didn't need to stay home and wear masks. So I think the message is getting out there. I'd say the better connection that people definitely are seeing in the United States now is the relationship between climate change and justice and environmental justice. And at POW, we've been doing a lot, POW USA, we've been doing a lot in the last couple of months to amplify that message and to work uh, collaboratively with the environmental justice community. So I think that message um, is a powerful one. And I think that's one that we can really reach a lot of people with. People who maybe up until now knew about climate change, but maybe weren't that motivated about it, now see it as linked to questions of justice. Um, I think that's a powerful message for a lot of people. Awesome. Um, and then Anthony asks, what about claiming disinformation in the age of fake news? <laughs> well, fake news is disinformation, right? Including the claim that, fake, you know, that real news is fake news, right? And that's where it can be challenging because you can easily find yourself going down a rabbit hole um, of he said, she said claims. But again, you can ask yourself, well, who is, who is making this claim? I and mean, one of the things that I try to do is just remind people, if you want to know about you know, baseball, you don't ask 
um, you know, a skier, right? You ask a baseball player or a baseball coach or a baseball manager. And so if you wanna know about science, you have to ask a scientist. And all of the disinformation about climate change doesn't come from scientists. As I said before, it comes from libertarian think tanks who are mostly funded by the fossil fuel industry or it comes from the fossil fuel industry itself. So you have to ask yourself, you know, who are these people and why are they saying these things? And once you put the, the question that way, it's obvious the fossil fuel industry is the most successful, most profitable industry in the history of mankind. They've got a good thing going and they don't want to lose it. And they've shown us now that they will go to very extreme lengths to defend their profits, um, even if, if it means that people are killed. And that's a sad thing to have to come to grips with. It's kind of shocking to think that people could be so venal as to not care that people are being killed by their products. But of course, that's what the tobacco industry did too. So it maybe isn't surprising that it's the same people who defended tobacco, who we often find now defending fossil fuels. Great. Um, and then just two more questions um, from Max Young. Naomi, do you think climate change denial has been the primary driver of anti-science slash anti-academic sentiment in the US? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think it's complicated. I don't think it's just one thing. So I wouldn't say climate denial is the only thing. Um, if you try to look at the broader picture, we do have some good data on this. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences did a very good report on this last year. Pew Foundation has done a lot of good work tracking um, Americans' attitudes towards science. And what we see is that the vast majority of the American people still do trust science about most things and still believe that science broadly makes our lives better. So there's not actually a general crisis of trust in science. And that's important to remember because again, we can't fix a problem if we misdiagnose it. So we should not diagnose this as a general crisis of trust in science, it's not what it is. But we do have particular areas where people are resistant to scientific claims. And the three big ones in the United States until this year were climate change, evolutionary biology, and vaccines. And those three are each a little bit different in their own way. So if we look at vaccines, that's the least politicized one because we don't have an organized vaccine denial movement funded by industry, because in this case, industry is on the side of vaccines. So what we have instead is a kind of looser coalition of families, celebrities, um, a range of different people who are upset about vaccination for one reason or another, um, but who can also be reached in certain kinds of ways. And the remedies are different um, depending upon what the problem is. Uh, there's a great book called The Panic Virus by Seth Mnookin. If anyone's interested in that, they might want to read that. Evolutionary biology is quite different. That's about evangelical Christians thinking that evolutionary biology um, refutes their religion which frankly it doesn't really, but it, that's the belief. And then there's climate change denial, which is rooted in conservative defense of free market economics. I mean, that's a short version of it. So each of these is a little bit different. What two of the three have in common, evolutionary biology denial and climate change denial, is that it's been aided and abetted by interested parties. So in the case of climate change denial by the fossil fuel industry and the libertarian think tanks and the promoters of laissez-faire economics, and in the case of evolutionary biology by evangelical Christians who are hostile both to science but also to certain forms of governance. And in some cases we see the climate change deniers and the evolutionary biology deniers making common cause. So there are ways to address these issues, um, but they're a little bit different depending upon what the issue is. So in the case of evolutionary biology, people at the University of Arizona, sorry, Arizona State University have done some very good work where they've shown if you sit down with students who come from evangelical Christian backgrounds and you say, well, you know, evolutionary biology does not disprove the existence of God. In fact, science can't disprove the existence of God because science and religion are two different things. Um, and in fact, there are many evolutionary biologists who are people of faith. And then if teachers assign readings by scientists who themselves believe in God, they, you find that this actually can be quite effective because then the student says, oh, I can accept evolutionary biology and I can still be an evangelical Christian. So that's a particular remedy for that particular um, form of science denial. We need different remedies for climate change denial. But what makes it hard is that it's being aided and abetted deliberately by the fossil fuel industry in the case of climate change. Okay, um, awesome. And um, we have a few more that have trickled in and I know we're a bit tight for time. 
but um, a good one here from Chris. Uh, how do we effectively battle the financial power of these fossil fuel companies who are able to fund political and disinformation campaigns on frankly a greater scale than pro-climate groups? Feels a little David and Goliath at times. Well, it is David and Goliath, but that's a great metaphor because if you know the story, you know that David wins, right? Because every Goliath has an Achilles heel. And I think that one of the big Achilles heels of the fossil fuel industry is that they're liars and that we can show that they have systematically lied. And as I said earlier, people don't like being lied to. So the more you can expose the disinformation for what it is, the more you can show that it's deliberate, that it's organized, that it's systematic, and that it's been going on for a long time, the more I think you can actually turn people away against the fossil fuel industry. The other thing is it is true that they've spent um, certainly hundreds of millions of dollars, possibly more on disinformation campaigns. But, you know, there are hundreds of millions of us. And, you know, if every U.S. citizen just gave one dollar to protect our winter, that'd be $330 million, right? And that's a lot of money. So I think, you know, I talked earlier about digging in. We all have to dig in. Uh, we have to give more time. We have to give more money. But we also have to reach out to friends and families and say, this is a David and Goliath fight. But the way we can win, or maybe we use a different metaphor, you know, Gulliver, right? The Lilliputians can win if we tie Gulliver up. And there are different ways that that can be done with political protests, with social protests, with consumer boycotts, with shareholder resolutions, with lawsuits. I mean, there's a whole panoply of tools out there that people are working on. And again, depending upon what you're most interested in, um, but, you know, like consumer boycotts can be effective. Uh, shareholder resolutions can be effective. There's a lot of different things out there that we have a record of success with, even in fighting very big and very powerful corporations. Awesome. Um, and from Izzy, uh, Naomi, if we look at the spectrum of allies from POW's active opposition, so people who are very against us, to our active allies, our members, our supporters, people in our audience, um, where would you suggest ambassadors, so the primary, the majority of people in this chat right now, concentrate their efforts as being people with, um, you know, quite a large audience and a, and a deep range of communication? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I guess I'd say two things about that. There are some people who are really dug into denial. And I think trying to spend a lot of time persuading them uh, to change their views is probably not the best use of your time. There are certain people who will just never be reached. Uh, the great physicist, Mach, physicist Max Planck once said, science progresses one funeral at a time. Now that's a little bit of a pessimistic view. I'm not sure I totally agree with it. But, but you know, there are some people who you just won't reach. And I don't think it's a good use of your time to spend a lot of people who are really you know, doubling down on denial. But there's a lot of people who are not in denial, but who are just not yet activated, or they're not sure what to think, or they'd like to do something, but they don't know what they can do. I think that's your target, right? Um, that whole community of people who, with the right support and the right encouragement, could become more involved. And even if it's just a little bit more. So, you know, when we first started Power USA, it cost $5 to join, right? If every Canadian donated $5, I mean, that would be giant. Right, so I think there's that. And the other thing is athletes, you already have followers. I mean, in some ways you're in a better position than an academic like me, who when I first went on Twitter had, you know, three followers and, you know, two of them were my daughters. <laughs> you know, I mean, you guys have people who are interested in you because of who you are, because of what you do, because you ski mountains or climb rocks or whatever it is you do. And that's this unbelievably great tool, right? Um, and that was the thing that Jeremy Jones so brilliantly tapped into when he created this whole movement, that you guys have followers and they're interested in what you have to say just because of who you are. And so, you know, you know better than I do who your followers are and what they're interested in. But if you can find some way to tap into that and say, okay, well, I'm going to use that as my lever, you know, to open this door a little bit and to talk to my followers about, you know, what, what's my ask this week or what's my ask this month? Maybe it's money, maybe it's voting, maybe it's coming to an event, you know, whatever it is, you can think about what your ask is and then think about who your community are and try to find an ask that mat matches your community. And I think that's, you know, terrifically powerful. You know, when I first started doing this, we used to joke about using our superpowers. And at first I thought it was a little hokey, but the more I hang out with athletes, the more I think it's right because, I mean, you guys are like superheroes, which is partly why like people love you, right? You do things that ordinary people can't do. 
you climb Mount Everest, you, you know, scale half dome, whatever it is, you know, you win an Olympic medal or you even just compete in the Olympics or you just even compete, you know, on the World Cup circuit or whatever it is you do, you do things that the rest of us can't do, but that inspires us. And we wanna be part of that. That's why we follow you because we get excited by feeling that we have a little piece of the excitement of your life. And if you can invite people into them and say, okay, now I've got an ask for you. And I do all these things that seem impossible. Well, actually you can do things that seem impossible too. And this gets back to the David and Goliath uh, issue. I'll tell you one more story and then we should probably wrap up. But um, I had the honor of going to Washington DC last September with a group of POW athletes, which including Conrad Anker. And uh, as most of you probably know, Conrad has climbed Mount Everest three times, found George Mallory's body, uh, was the head of the North Face climbing team for many years. You know, Conrad does unbelievable things. And so he and I did this event together with congressional staffers. So these are mostly young people who work for senators and congressmen. And I said to them, I said, part of the problem of this challenge is it is a David and Goliath challenge. It feels really, really difficult. It may at times feel impossible. But I'm sitting next to a man, Conrad Anker, who has done something that to me seems impossible. He has climbed Mount Everest three times. Like I couldn't even climb it once. Well, I made it to base camp, but you know, he's done impossible things. So here in the room are people who have done things that seem impossible. And I'm here to say to you today, you can do things that seem impossible too. And the challenge is to figure out what those things are and then to do them. Amazing. All right, well, I think that's a, a great place to, um wrap things up. Izzy, let me know if um, there's anything else we need to touch upon. But yeah. um, just thank you so much once again, Naomi. Yeah, it's great to be with you all. And thank you all for your work and your effort and uh, hang in there, you know. Thanks. We're, gonna, we're gonna crush this one. We have to crush it. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great time, you. Naomi. You're welcome. Bye. Take care. Good luck. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Okay, for everyone else, um, we're gonna take a break here. It's lunchtime, get outside time. Um, so today I mentioned in my initial email that it uh, Fridays for Future is called today, the Global Day of Climate Action. And last year, a bunch of us were out striking with them. Um, COVID has changed that a bit this year. There are some gatherings happening, but not as many. Um, and we're here today gathering. So this is equally as important. Um, but we really want to show support for the Fridays for Future movement still and Greta and all the amazing work they've done. So we're encouraging you guys to go outside. It's pretty rainy here right now, but Greg and I are going to go for a run um, and get outside, appreciate the outdoors, maybe, maybe take a photo, post a picture, just showing your appreciation for uh, that movement if you can. Um, we're striking virtually today. And uh, yeah, grab some lunch and we'll be back at one o'clock to for the ambassadors just to talk about the ambassador program, our fall campaign, um, some new social media tools, and then Mike Douglas will wrap it up at the end of the day. So we have an, another good couple of hours ahead of us and we'll see you guys soon. Awesome. Sorry, Izzy, did you say, what time are we back? One o'clock. Oh, okay. So just an hour. Uh, oh, sorry. One thirty. Yeah, thank you. 130. Uh, 130. An hour and so, a half. Cool. Whistler people, um, climate strike starting at Lost Lake right now, if you can make it. Are you picking picking me up on the way, Douglas? Who needs a ride? Uh, right up at the lake, Mike? Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure where you're starting. I guess by the time we get there, that they will be on their way to the village. So we may just have to try and join them. You yeah, might want to just park in like the day lots or somewhere around there and then like pick it up where you can. They're starting at the lake and then walking on the valley trail towards the Muni. Um, it seems like it's a pretty small group right now, but if you can meet them on the trail, it would mean a lot to them, I'm sure. Yeah, same, same as last year. Cool. I'll meet yeah. you guys on the trail. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. We'll see, see you everyone soon. at 1.30. Pick me up in five, Douglas? Yeah, I'll pick you up in five, Stannis. Goodbye. Okay, <laughs>